Good morning. It's Sunday morning, December the 20th. Welcome to Hillside Community Church's online broadcast for church this morning. It's the final Sunday before Christmas 2020. Can you believe it? Almost approaching 2021. I'm so glad that you're able to be here with us this morning. And despite all of what's happening in the world right now, we have so much to be thankful to God for. Now, the scriptures foretold the coming of the Savior into the world. We've been following a series in uh, 1 Peter that I've been doing, but this week I'm going to take a break from 1 Peter, and I'm going to pick up again on that next week. Today, I'd like to focus in on Christmas. Would you bow with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the opportunity to give you praise and glory for all the good things that you are and all the good things that you have done. Jesus, this Christmas season, I just pray that each person that's listening to this broadcast, Father, you know the needs that are present, and I pray that each heart would be turned towards you. For those that know you, God, I pray that at the end of today, Father, that they would be drawn closer to you and that there would just be sweet communion. And for those that don't know you, God, I pray that you would show them how much you love them this Christmas, and may your word come through this message in the way that you've intended. In Jesus' name, amen. So right now, if you're uh, able to get communion elements, I would ask that you get those prepared as at the end of the sermon today, there's going to be communion for the believers. Anyways, so let's talk about Christmas. I, I, I know that it's been a difficult year, but we need to turn our mind towards what God has accomplished through Christmas. A thousand years before the day of Christmas, there was a man who sought to know the Lord. He was a man after God's own heart, yet a man who is deeply aware of his unworthiness in his flesh to approach God. He was a man who recognized that he was a sinner and the rebellion of his nature was such that he needed a savior. In Psalm 143, David, the second king of Israel, cried out to God in this prayer. O oh Lord, hear my prayer. Listen to my cry for mercy. In your faithfulness and righteousness come to my relief. Do not bring your servant into judgment, for no one living is righteous before you. The enemy pursues me, he crushes me to the ground. He makes me to dwell in the darkness like those long dead. So my spirit grows faint within me. My heart within me is dismayed. I remember the days of long ago. I meditate on your works and consider what your hands have done. I spread out my hands to you. I thirst for you like a parched land. Answer me quickly, O Lord. My spirit fails. Do not hide your face from me, or I will be like those who go down to the pit. Let the morning bring me word of your unfailing love. For I have put my trust in you. Show me the way that I should go. For to you I entrust my life. Rescue me. Rescue me from my enemies, O Lord. For I hide myself in you. Teach me to do your will. For you are my God. May your good spirit lead me on level ground. For your name's sake, O Lord, preserve my life. In your righteousness, bring me out of trouble. In your unfailing love, silence my enemies. Destroy all my foes, for I am your servant. When you look at this passage and the heart of the writer, we see that David was called by God himself a man after his own heart. Because he knew, David knew his heart. And he recognized how the Lord's ways were so much higher than his own ways. He knew that there were great enemies all around him that longed to put him down. And he knew that without the Lord's mercy, he would have no chance. David humbled himself before God. And he, he pleased the Lord in this way. God heard the cry from the depths of his heart. And in his sovereign will, God predetermined and promised 
that his salvation for the human race would come through King David's line. Now we fast forward in history 300 years after King David penned this. God sent another person to speak on his behalf to Israel. And his name was Isaiah the prophet. Isaiah had been commissioned by God to prophesy during his plans for Israel, concerning his plans for Israel and his plans for the future of the world. And in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, we're told of the prophecy of the coming of a Savior. The Jews called him a Messiah, who would bring spiritual light into a spiritually dark world. Isaiah cries out, Nevertheless, he says, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people in walking in darkness have seen a great light on those living in the land of deep darkness. A light has dawned. Several verses later, Isaiah continues in his prediction that this light shining in Galilee of the Gentiles, in the ancient land of the tribes of Zebulun and Naphtali, would not be the would be would not be an object that gives light, but a person that gives light. For he says in verses six and seven, for to us a child is born. To us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing it and upholding it with justice and righteousness. From that time on and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Further to this, we're told by another prophet named Micah, who was prophesying around around the same time that Isaiah was, that the child to be born, whose name would be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, would not only rule on David's throne forever, but he'd be coming into the world, born in the little town of Bethlehem in Judea. 700 years went by after Micah and Isaiah. Then God saw fit to put his plan into action, to send a Savior into the world in answer to David's prayer a thousand years before. It is written in Luke chapter 1, 31 and 32 that a woman named Mary who was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, was approached by an angel who told her this, You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call his name Jesus. He will be great and called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. Mary and Joseph, both of whom were of the direct house and lineage of King David, were the parents. We're told how God assured Joseph that Mary was not pregnant because she had never been with a man. She was not pregnant with the seed of a man. The Holy Spirit of God overshadowed her and she became supernaturally pregnant. This was in fulfillment of another prophecy that Isaiah had given concerning the Savior that was to come in Isaiah chapter 714 in which he said, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. You see, it was of chief importance that the Savior to come was both fully man and fully God. God sent Jesus Christ into the world that first Christmas because of his love for humanity and his desire to answer the heart's cry of his servant David a thousand years before it happened. The Bible speaks in Genesis of Adam, the father of all humanity, being responsible for the sin that polluted the entire world. 
where all of Adam's offspring were born into the world as sinners because of what he had done and because of what they did after him. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The Bible tells us that the penalty of sin is death, both physically and spiritually. But because of His great love for humanity, God sent His Son into the world to sacrifice Himself for the sins of the entire world. The baby Jesus born into the world that first Christmas Eve in Bethlehem was no ordinary man. He was fully man and can trace his lineage to the house and lineage of David as prophesied by Isaiah. Yet he was born into the world to become the second Adam, to undo what the first Adam had done. What the first Adam had done in bringing disobedience to the human race, the second Adam did in bringing obedience and becoming a sin bearer for the Most High God on behalf of the Most High God, a sin bearer for the sins of the entire world to make a way for the penalty of sin to be taken care of. God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. For God so loved the world that He gave this one and only Son that whosoever believes in Him, they should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus Christ, the Son of David and Son of God, was sent into the world as a sinless gift, the first Christmas gift. And this is why we celebrate Christmas by giving each other gifts in remembrance of the ultimate gift that God gave us in His Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ showed us what God was like with skin on. But most of all, Jesus Christ came to bring spiritual life to whoever would place their trust in Him as Savior. The Lord had mercy upon David and his family through Jesus in answer to David's prayer. John the Baptist heralded the coming of Jesus into the world where we read in John chapter 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man who came from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives life to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God, children not born of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning Him. He cried out, saying, This is the one I spoke about when I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me because He was before me. Out of His fullness we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God but the one and only Son who himself is God and is in closest relationship with the Father who has made him known. Amen. What a powerful passage of Scripture, a Christmas Scripture this morning. We celebrate the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ because he is the living Word of God. God in the flesh who came to us as a gift from the Father. As believers in God's gift of salvation, we want to give thanks to God for giving Jesus to us as a gift. Nobody's exactly sure the exact date that Jesus was born, but we have set aside December 24th and 25th on our calendars to commemorate His incarnation. Jesus was born into the world as the prophets had foretold, and He became a man. He healed the sick, He opened blind eyes, fed the hungry, and raised the dead in the physical as a foreshadow of what He would do in the spiritual. Indeed, Jesus was a king. He was both of house and lineage of David, just as the prophecies foretold, but the kingdom of Jesus was not physical. As a matter of fact, 
Prior to his crucifixion, when Christ was standing before his accusers in the trial before Governor Pontius Pilate of, Pilate of Rome, Pilate rightly defined Jesus as the King of the Jews. David cried out in Psalm 143 for God to rescue him from the darkness, and God answered his prayer. Jesus came and willingly laid down his life for the people of the world and became their sin bearer. Jesus became the second Adam who would undo that curse and penalty of sin. Whoever believes in Jesus as their Messiah and whoever confesses him as Lord will be saved from their sin by Emmanuel. The Apostle Paul writes to us in Romans 10, 8-12, But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As the scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Over the centuries, there have been many traditions that have come to be a part of Christmas celebrations. Lights, trees, gifts, festive food, drinks, and family gatherings. This year, some of our traditions have been altered because of the crisis that we are facing in our communities. We may not get to spend time with our extended family and friends in the manner that we are used to or the manner that we would like to. On top of this, I think sometimes our heart can be pulled away from the true meaning of Christmas due to the just seeming weightiness of the, the world around us. Some people have never really truly come to understand the meaning of Christmas. For you who have understood the meaning of Christmas, maybe you need a reminder today of what this day coming up is all about. An encouragement to know that Emmanuel has come. Emmanuel has made His presence known with you. He's filled your heart with light and love based upon the sacrificial giving that He he gave to you on the cross. The blood of Christ has washed away the sins of all who believe and confess Him as Lord. His broken body was broken for us. It grieves my heart to see so many people ignoring the, the invitation to salvation that the Lord of all creation has given. So many people spend their lives living for themselves, missing out on the big picture. The word of life has been revealed to them, but they don't understand what the living word asks them to do, nor do they comprehend his purposes. But what Paul said here in the Romans, what I just read, is the core message of Christmas. This week leading up to Christmas, I pray that you would open your heart to hear the word of the Lord. My friends, Christmas is about the salvation that God has sent into the world in the person of Jesus. The salvation is joy for all people. A Savior, Christ the Lord, has been born to us. And He desires to, to cleanse us and to heal us spiritually and to make us at one with God and bring us to Him and make oneness between us and God. God came to us in Jesus in order that we would be saved but more than that, in order that we would be transformed in the renewing of our minds, that we would be saved both in position, but also saved in bringing us close to our Creator, in a relationship with Him that is living and vibrant, starting here and now and continuing into all of eternity. And that is something we can have great joy about and something we can be thankful for. Leading up to Christmas, I think it's appropriate today for believers in Jesus who are listening to this broadcast for us all to take communion together. If you don't know the Lord and you've heard the word of the Lord today, know that you can become a believer in Jesus Christ by bowing the knee of your heart to Him and ask Him to be your Savior. If you can confess with your mouth 
You repent of the way you've been living. Repent of your sins. Turn away from the the lifestyle you've been living and turn to Jesus and ask Him to forgive you for your sins. You can ask Him to be your Savior today. And the Bible says that He'll take your transgressions, your sin, and cast it as far as the east is from the west, never to be remembered again. Cast into the sea of forgetfulness. Jesus will cleanse your heart and then his whole, the Holy Spirit of God will come and make His home within you. And that is the greatest gift that can be given because it is the deposit of the Holy Spirit which seals us for eternal life because after this life is done, the hope that the believer has and the knowledge that he is living in harmony with the Almighty God, that will turn into eternal life when God sees us standing before Him. He'll look at us and He won't look at all the horrible things we've done. He'll look at us and He'll see that we've been cleansed by His Son's sacrifice. And He'll say, Well done, you good and faithful servant. Enter into my glory. Leading up to Christmas, communion. For the saints, this is a sacred time. We all know that God commanded us from the very beginning, from the Last Supper on, that we're to remember Him every time we participate in the communion ceremony. And it's more than just a ceremony. It's an acknowledgement of remembrance of the Lord and all that He has done in paying for the, the, the penalty of our sins, for taking our sins upon His shoulders and for cleansing us. His body was broken for us. His blood was shed for us that we might have atonement, at one with the Father. Jesus came to give His life to save your soul from eternal separation from Him. And this is something that we celebrate this Christmas. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the blood that cleanses us. The blood that you shed on Calvary those many years ago. Thank you, Lord, that you love us so much that you offered yourself so that we could have life. For it's your blood that atones for our sin. It's your blood that cleanses us and gives us life. So we thank you, O Father, for sending Jesus. And Jesus, we thank you for dying for our sins, for shedding your blood for our sins, for allowing yourself to be scourged and broken by the hands of men so that the full penalty of our sins could be placed upon your shoulders. We honor you today, Lord. We honor you in all of your goodness. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, for coming and making your home within us after Jesus has paid the price for our sins, You have come and made us Your temple so that we are living stones built upon the foundation of rock, laid down. God, we thank You that You are our cornerstone. Father, as we take communion, may You be honored. We remember You today. In Jesus' name, Amen. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 23-29, the Apostle Paul says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night He was betrayed, He took bread and He said, This is My body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of Me. Paul went on to say how we must remember the broken body of the Lord when we eat this bread. And we should be very careful how we participate in this ceremony. We need to analyze our hearts. If there's anything in between us and Him right now, we just need to lay that down. I would ask you today, if there's anything that is not right between you and God, I'm going to take a moment of silence. We need to ask God to forgive us for that. And ask Him to make our hearts ready to receive communion.
Thank you, Lord. Let us partake, partake of the bread today together. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Lord, thank you for the blood that was shed. Thank you, Lord, for cleansing us of our sins and purifying us, for taking the penalty upon yourself and dying instead of us. We remember you, Lord, and we take this cup to proclaim salvation in your name till your return. Let us partake of the cup together. Thank you, Lord. God, we know that your favor rests upon us. So we thank you. Thank you, Lord, for giving us the joy of your salvation and for loving us so much and for giving us peace that surpasses understanding, that guards our hearts and our minds in you and for a hope that endures. Thank you, Lord, for sealing us and giving us your spirit to walk with us through our daily living. God, I pray for everyone out there today as they go their separate ways and as we celebrate Christmas with our individual families and even those that are by themselves. Lord, I pray that they would be sheltered beneath the shadow of your wing. They would know the comfort that comes from the Comforter. And I pray all these things, all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week and a Merry Christmas to you. Tonight, on Christmas Eve at 5 p.m., I hope you'll tune in with us for our Christmas Eve service. Until then, the Lord bless you. Amen.